Davy was scared. Davy was scared. Davy was scared. I scared. I scared Davy shitless one day. One day he was at a press conference and I snuck in and uh, I came behind him. And I said, "Let's go, champ!" And he he jumped and he said, <laughs> "I said, no, no, look, look, look." And it was a little speck. And I said, "Look," and it was him. Let's go! Let's go! <laughs> I was like, "Yo, make a wave. Let's knock him off the pool." Okay. Knocked him off the board and then he was pissed. Well, I was a homeless teenager at the age of 13, 14. Me and my mom, we lost our apartment. That began my journey into trying to find a way out, you know, trying to find a way out of poverty. Boxing gave me an opportunity to have a life that I wouldn't have. Like I said, my father died in prison. My mother died of a drug overdose on my birthday. So boxing was something that gave me the opportunity to be here today. I was at a down point in my life about, uh, I want to say about 14, 13, 14 years ago, and I was really depressed, and I was going through some psychological, I got back in shape, and I started less saying, let's go champ as a mantra, because everybody was gone. I had to be my own cheerleader. Rob Tabbit here for Boxing News. Delighted to be joined by the former WBO heavyweight champion of the world. It's the champ. It's Shannon Briggs. We're here. There he is. Look at him. We're here in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. Champ, always a pleasure. How are you getting on? All is well, Rob. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. I'm excited. I just got here. I'm a little beat up from, from the flight, uh, from um, jet lag, but I'm, I'm doing pretty good, actually. Excited about being here. Well, we're excited to have you, champ. Um, how long was the journey? Good question. I left at 4 o'clock this morning from Thailand, and uh, I think my plane took off at 8. I don't even know. I slept the whole way, although I slept I slept about an hour before the flight landed. And um, But I'm a, little, I'm a little beat up, I'm going to be honest with you, champ. But I've been traveling the world for the last couple months and weeks at least. I was in um, uh, Saudi Arabia, then I went to Dubai, then I was in Thailand, and I'm just traveling the world right now. Living the life, right? Well, I'm just getting ready for a fight, so, you know, I'm going different places, looking for the best specialists at everything, and uh, Thailand was a place that I visited not too long ago, and I met some really good um, doctors and um, some really good masseuse that helped me out with my stretching and my flexibility, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. You're fighting again. Yes, sir, I'm fighting. Uh, hopefully, I'll be fighting Rampage Jackson in, in Riyadh in, um, in March, and if not him, I'm somebody else, but I think it's going to be Rampage. But I'm excited about being back in the ring. Uh, even, there's even talks about Mike Tyson returning to the ring, and I always wanted that fight, and I think it'd be a great fight for the Barclay Center. That's one of the things I, I was going to kind of talk to you about today. You mentioned before we started, you know, what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about you. We're going to oh, go, wow. go back a little bit and, uh, and talk Thanks, about some Rob. of your early days, and, you, and you're already talking about Mike Tyson, who, of course, uh, a New Yorker, Brownsville. Yes, um, sir. Talk to me about your early days in, in Brownsville in New York. Uh, you know, I'm born and raised in Brownsville all my life. So was Mike, and uh, so was Riddick Bow, three heavyweight champions from the same neighborhood, which is unheard of. Um, uh, not even two miles in size, the neighborhood. We have the most housing projects than anywhere in the world. We have the highest crime rate. Poverty level is very high, so it's a very it's a very tough neighborhood where you have to defend yourself and fight for yourself. And that's what we did. That's what I did, and that's what Mike did, of course. And um. You know, it's a great neighborhood. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse just, me. You've just touched upon it there. Is that what it brings? I mean, we know kind of boxing. For, for more or more or less, it kind of, you know, difficult backstories and difficult backgrounds breed fighters. You know, that's yes. what it does. It's a very brutal sport. What was it like in the neighborhood back then? And, and was it about that kind of, that rough and ready life that produced three champions, as you've said? Definitely. In the 70s and 80s, me growing up in the 70s and 80s, it was tough. You know, it was fun. For me, at least, we thought it was fun, but it was it was uh, it was a neighborhood where, as you had to learn how to fight early, everyone could fight: the kids, the mothers, the grandmothers, the aunts, the dogs, the cats. Everybody could fight in Brownsville. So uh, we have a we have a we have a reputation for being the guys who always come and looking for fights and fighting guys. So again, like I said, everybody could fight in Brownsville. It's hard to see. You can go anywhere in Brownsville and see somebody fighting, but. We all love. One thing about brands is we stick together. You know, we're a small neighborhood, but we stick together. And a good example of, you know, what can be achieved if you if you take that fighting from the streets into the boxing gym, as yourself and Mike and Riddick all did. Um, what was it that took you from the street into the boxing gym? Well, I was a homeless teenager at the age of 13, 14. Me and my mom, we lost our apartment. And um, that began my journey into trying to find a way out, you know, trying to find a way out of poverty. And uh, my mom was suffering from a drug addiction at the time, and I wanted to help her and get us a place. So I went to the Starry City Boxing Club and started boxing. 
as an amateur for on and off for four years and decided at the age of about 19 to take it serious as a career because there wasn't much else for me uh, besides death in jail. My father died in prison. I'm the only child. My mother, I'm the only child. You know, my, I have no brothers and sisters, so I had to fend for myself and uh, got into boxing, and it, it turned out to be something fortunate that got me off the streets. And now my goal is to do the same thing, to help kids back in Brownsville. I'm opening up a gym called the Brownsville Boxing Academy where we not only teach people how to become a boxer or a trainer, but to be a referee, a manager, a promoter, a timekeeper, a judge. And we're trying to, you know, bring some some job opportunities from Brownsville. I feel as though Brownsville has brought over billions, over a billion dollars to the boxing, uh, to the sport of boxing. If you look at Danny Jacobs, Curtis Stevens, we have Shoe Shoe, Eddie, the great Eddie Mustafa Muhammad from Brownsville. Again, Mike Tyson, Riddick Boy, and myself. So my goal is to... Um, to, to show the people of Brownsville, to give them something, to show them that we have something. You have something to be proud of. We have former champions, and we've put a lot into this business. And I think that we should, when you go look for a boxer in the world, you should go to Brownsville. When you go look for a jockey, you go to India. If you go looking for a baseball player, you go to either Cuba or it's Dominican Republic or somewhere. When you look for a boxer, you should go to Brownsville, Brooklyn. Now, New York, once upon a time, and I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll disagree with what I'm about to say, once upon a time was the epicenter of boxing. It was, it was the hub, the home of boxing. In recent years, I mean, the names that you've just rattled off there, most of them are from, from eras gone by. Nowadays, New York doesn't churn out the same level of champions as it has done historically. Why do you think that is? Do you think that's just a change of the times? Is it not a similar place? Why, why do you think that is? Change of the times and, 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 and as well as... Uh you know, the people need something to to uh, gravitate toward that they can be proud of, and I think that this this will happen with the Brownsville Boxing Academy. I think they'll see pride in a, a place that they'll have their own their own team. We're going to have a band for the team. We're going to have um, a restaurant for the team where they come and eat. The kids will be able to, uh, you know, everyone that won't make it in boxing, but that's okay. The, we're, we're trying to save lives right now. The, the murder rate in Brownsville is very, very high, one of the highest in New York City. And, um, you know, when I was a kid, as a homeless teenager, I walked those streets many days. So for me now to be able to, um, you know, this is something I've been thinking about for the last 20 years. And now for it to actually be happening, we're actually um, uh, co-producing the, the, the film. Actually, excuse me, I, let me take a step back. We just signed a deal to do a, uh, a show on Amazon, two, uh, eight, ser- eight episodes, excuse me, eight episode series about Brownsville, and um, we actually have some huge names attached, huge names attached, and um, Sam Rockwell is co-producing it. Uh, Michael Rappaport is, is, is directing it, along with other directors, John Forte, and other people that we're speaking to who want to be a part of the project. So it's a huge project that I'm very excited about, and I'm looking forward to the Brownsville Box Academy changing lives, let alone if, if Mike Tyson and Shannon Briggs and Riddick Bogan come from there, we may get an, a, we may get another great heavyweight from from Brownsville or a lightweight or middleweight. You mentioned Michael Rappaport, big big boxing fan. Always see him at the the major shows over the years. I just want to go back a little bit. You mentioned about being homeless on the streets of Brownsville. You know, I, I've never been homeless. I can't imagine how difficult that would have been for you and your mother. How can you put that into words? What was it like that period of your life? It was uh, traumatizing traumatizing in a sense whereas um you know not knowing where you're gonna live not knowing where you're gonna sleep tonight and you know going to friends houses and sleeping on couches and you know you never know where you're gonna end up that night and uh sometimes i would say i'd rather go to jail because i know to have a place a roof over my head but um fortunately uh boxing was an outlet for me the starry city boxing club became my home in a sense whereas I would sleep in the gym sometimes and I had no other way out you know um I wasn't great in school I was born with asthmatic with asthma I was asthmatic as a child and I didn't do great in school you know I missed a lot of school not because I wasn't smart because I was sick a lot in the New York brutal winters so um boxing gave me an opportunity to have a life that I wouldn't have like I said my father died in prison my mother died of a drug overdose on my birthday so boxing was something that Gave me the opportunity to be here today. Just um, on Mike, what were your earliest memories of Mike Tyson in Brownsville? Just watching him on television, you know, 
seeing him once or twice in the neighborhood and being in awe. He actually was best friends with uh, best friends. His best friend in the world is a guy named Rusty. Was his best friend as a child growing up, and Rusty was uh, was uh, he used to babysit me sometimes. My mother used to say, "Watch my boy, watch my baby." I was a little baby, you know, eight months old, and my mother would leave me with this him and his sister, and um, that was Mike Tyson's best friend. So Mike lived across the street from us. So from from being from that neighborhood and having Mike Tyson. In the neighborhood, Rick Bo lived upstairs from me. I lived on the fourth floor. I, think he li- I lived on the third floor. He lived on the fourth floor. We lived in the same building. So you know, having that, and I worked for Zab Judah's father. I worked for Yoel Judah. My first, one of my first jobs was uh, demolition, working for him. So you know, I had I had some real strong people around me, and I to look upon and say, yo, this is a tough neighborhood, but I'm gonna make my way out of it. Having that, having somebody like Mike, as you mentioned there, you know, seeing everything that's around you, the problems that you had growing up and the problems that are still kind of prevalent in Brownsville, seeing somebody like Mike who's emerged through all of that must have given you such inspiration and, and such a, a motivation as a young man. 100%. Um, you know, I, you know, seeing Mike fight in the 80s, uh, we would all gather around the television and, you know, watch him fight. And here we are now, you know, I'm an adult, and we're good friends, and I love Mike. And we, we laugh and talk about it. A few weeks ago, we were in Saudi Arabia together, and we was like, can you, Mike said to me, can you believe it? We're from Brownsville, and here we are in Saudi Arabia, man. We came a long way. So I'm, I'm very, you know, um, respectful of, of, of the, boy, the guys before me because they paved the way. Boxing as an amateur, what did it mean to you to box internationally? You boxed for the US, you wore that vest very proudly, you competed at some some very, very high level international tournaments. What did that mean to you? Again, being a boy from Brownsville, coming from seemingly nowhere and being able to represent your country. It was really, just to be honest with you, champ, it all happened so fast and it was all happening, you know, at the moment. It was nothing was nothing was planned, to be honest with you. One day I was uh, sleeping on a train and then uh, my friend asked me to go to a gym and next thing you know, I'm fighting on the USA team, you know. But um, it was it was it was it was it was it was written, obviously, you know what I'm saying? Because who would have ever thought that I would have became a boxer to begin with? I didn't have brothers and sisters growing up. I wasn't a tough kid. I wasn't a kid that was fighting a lot, you know. I had my share fights, you know. I had to defend myself again. I had no brothers and sisters, but getting the boxing, I had a skill. I had I was fast, good vision. And um, I was kicking ass. <laughs> now, one amateur fight in particular I'd like to talk to you about, or one fighter that you boxed as an amateur, somebody who maybe, you know, I would hope that certainly a big part of our audience are familiar with him, the great Cuban, Felix Savon, Ooh. who you shared the ring with in the Pan American Games. Yes. What was it like boxing Felix Savon, and how good was he? For people who obviously never turned pro, he was a Cuban icon, how good was he, and what do you think he could have achieved had he have gone pro? I think he was an amazing, you know, he he was uh, tall, lanky, and he had a size advantage and he had an uh, experience advantage. And to be honest with you, champ, he was fighting all his life in regards to uh, full time. And here we were kids coming off the streets. I mean, I literally fought the guy, had 18 amateur fights. Um, and I, I got in his head a few, few, a few, um, I seen him a few days before the fight. And he was running, and I was running, and I was t- antagonizing him. And people were like, hey, ain't you scared of him? I was like, for what? You know, but uh, thinking back in retrospect, I, I I really had a good psych game going on. I had to psych myself up. You know, I had to really psych my. Here I was fighting a guy with maybe 300, 400 amateur fights. He was way bigger than me. He got on the scale. The scale said 220. We were fighting at 200. I was like, hey, that's say 220. And he was like, oh, no, no, no. They pushed him off the scale. I was weighing 189 pounds. He, he knocked, he hit me so hard, he knocked the crap out of me. Um, I didn't even know the fight happened. We was on a bus going back to the, back to the, um, to the village to pack our stuff to leave to go back to America. And I asked my friend. I said, um, "Man, I was looking out the window, and it seemed like we had been on the bus for hours." Because you know, I said, "Man, when we gonna get there, man?" I said, "Yeah, what, when we gonna get there? We've been." He said, "What?" He asked me. He said. I said, when we going to get this? It's taking forever. He said, man, you fought already. I said, what? I said, shh, be quiet. He told that, hey, yo, he don't even remember. But um, I tried to play it off, and then it started coming back to me. You know, I remember Fidel putting the silver medal on me, and it started hitting me like, wait a minute. 
There was a little delay, I think, and we watched it again on ABC Wild World Sports, and I was like, wow. He, he hit me so hard that I didn't even remember the fight happened. <laughs> Too him funny. In, putting him into that mix of great 90s heavyweights. People always talk about the great 90s heavyweights and the 70s, of course. How do you think he would have got on had he have gone pro with yourself, with Lennox, with Mike, with Riddick Bow? How do you think Savon would have would have handled himself in that era, do you think? It's really hard to say because um, a lot of times guys like that who are forced in a system of boxing like that, like a comedy system, they usually don't do good when they have freedom. Usually when they have, like, they usually go to Miami or wherever they go, they usually kind of get into the partying and the drinking and the drugs and it kind of inhibits. So we, we can't really tell. Maybe he would have not done that. Who knows? But, um, you know, we can't never tell. You know, it's like the, it's like the comic book, what if? <laughs> what if? Turning pro, was that always the plan? Or did, was it, again, something that it seems like kind of obviously knowing a knowing about your backstory and obviously hearing from yourself here seems like a lot of these things happen very very quickly mm -hmm. was that the plan to go pro or was it something that again you kind of just went with it because it was is there and it was happening yeah nothing was planned uh like i said i was homeless one day the next day i was uh you know in the gym and i was you know i actually got tricked into fighting my first fight they say hey, come to the fights and just watch you know we want to you know show you what it's like and i said okay cool and they took me to the fights, and they said, "Now nah, you fighting. And I was like, no, nah, no, nah, I just started. I'm not fighting. They said, no, nah, no, nah, you fighting, or you're going to walk home. And I was like, and I remember we had uh, came from Brooklyn to Staten Island where I had my first fight, and we crossed over the Verrazano Bridge. And it was a huge bridge, and I couldn't imagine myself walking back over the bridge because I didn't want to fight. I was like, there's no way I could fight. I can't fight. These guys are experienced, you know. And I fought a guy with experience, and he – um I think he dropped me in the first round with a body shot or something like that. He was beating me. I was never had never been in the ring. It was a packed house, and um, I looked over at my corner. My my trainer, Jimmy O'Farrell, the late great Jimmy O'Farrell, said, "If you don't get up, you're walking home." And I remembered that bridge. I got up <laughs> and I beat the hell out of him. I dropped him in the third round with a right hand, and I got the decision. And you know, Rob, it was amazing because it was my first trophy ever won. I had never been good at sports. I, I can't dribble. I can't catch a baseball. I can't play sports at all. So um, for me, you know what I'm saying, having that trophy, I remember on the, the ride home, I was holding the trophy, and I fell asleep that night with the trophy at home. In the bed, I actually had a little apartment that I was staying in. Uh, it was a little abandoned apartment. I was staying in the barn, but I slept with the trophy that night, and that was something for me. That was an amazing night for me. You mentioned earlier about the, the tragic passing of your mother, who you've been very open in the past about her, her struggles with addiction. Yes. Uh, I mean, it seems like a silly question to ask. Your mother passing on your birthday, how do, you, how do you go about managing that? How do you go about trying to process that? How does that impact on, on a still very young man? Yeah, devastating, hard, because I dreamed it. The night before, I dreamed it. I dreamed she came to me. In my high school, I was in, I was back in high school, and she had came in. And my friends was like, hey, man, your mother's so funny. She came to the class, and she was laughing. I seen her in the hallways, and then she went up some stairs. But there is no, like, there's stairs, but they go to the roof. And she went up these stairs. So it was weird. The phone rang, and my, and my aunt said, um, I heard her talking to my cousin in the other room, and she said, yeah, Margie died, which is my mom. And I knew it because I had just dreamed it. But my mother always told me, she said, when something happens to me, you're going to know it. Because we, we had a bond, a connection. And uh, it was the oddest thing to me. To this day, I still can't. Uh, it happened. I can tell you the truth. It happened. My cousin can tell you he was right there because he said, nah, I said, I said, um, he hung up the phone. And I said, my mother died. And he said, nah. He said, yeah, how'd you know? I said, I just dreamed about her. And that was it. And that was the end of it. And that was it. But she always, we had a strong bond. I'm our only child. We were um, glued at the hip. You know what I mean? So we glued at the hip. So for me, that, that let me know there's, that we call it the paranormal. <laughs> it's something out there. It was really an amazing, amazing thing. So for me, um, that's always been something that I, 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 I want to say I'll take pride in. But I, take, I, take, I do take pride in the fact that my mother was strong and that she raised a single child in Brownsville the most dangerous neighborhood in New York State, the most dangerous neighborhood by far, if not one of the most dangerous places in the country. 
she raised a single child by herself, and I became heavyweight champion of the world. So um, I take pride in that. She was a strong woman. Now, as everybody who's watching this will know, you have a very long storied career. We're going to kind of pick a couple of little bits and pieces <laughs> okay. to discuss. Um, one of them, probably a, a less happier note, uh, your fight with Lennox Lewis, uh, which was a, a fantastic fight still to this day. One of my favorite heavyweight fights oh, to go back you, and watch. Uh, what are your recollections of that fight? And obviously at, at that stage you, of your career, boxing Lennox, who was still you know, yet to become the Lennox that he eventually became at the later stage of his career. What were your, your recollections of that fight? Uh, honored to have fought a, the one of the greatest heavyweights of all times, if not the greatest heavyweight of all time. I mean, in his day, he could be, you know, or any given night, he could be any other heavyweight champion in the world of any era because of his size, his poise. You know, he wasn't the most um, flamboyant fighter where, you know, stylistic fighter when you look at like an Ali or even a Holmes with the jab. But he got the job done. He had a great jab, great right hand, tremendous uppercut, sick left hook when he landed it, when he threw it. He wasn't always throwing it, but when he did, <clears throat> when he did, it was very effective. So to have Ford, a legend like that, a great, means a lot for me because, you know, who, who, who would have ever thought a kid from Brownsville, I went to private school, I went to Lutheran school, I went to Catholic high school, here I am sharing a ring with a great, you know what I mean? So here, yeah, you know, something to be proud of. He later said that you had the fastest hands and were the heaviest puncher of anybody who he shared the ring with, which when you correctly say about Lennox and his standing in the heavyweight history books, really, is quite the compliment. Oh, it's unbelievable to hear that. If you know, if he said that, then I'm, it's one of the best things you could ever say about me and to me because I respect him at the utmost. I think, again, I say on any given night, he could have beat any heavyweight champion in history. I think he might be, if not the best, because... He uh, he had something that, you know, you can't beat Lennox twice. <laughs> you, you can't beat Lennox twice. Um, Lennox got, he found a way. He was dedicated. He had a strong mother with him, a strong team. And that's very important. You know, I watched him and I watched his team. I watched how he moved. And that's what made him great as well. You never boxed Mike Tyson. You never boxed Riddick Bow. How would those fights have gone? Which one would have been the easier fight? Which one would, was, would have been the one that you would have wanted? Nah, they both would have knocked me out in the first round, <laughs> especially Mike. But Riddick, me and Riddick would have probably got busy. But um, Riddick is an amazing fighter, one of the greatest heavyweights. Again, top 10, top 5. Uh, you know, he didn't have the longest career, but at his best, um, who could have beaten him? I mean, look at the fight with him and Holyfield. It was an amazing fight. He had a nice little run. I mean, you know, unfortunately, his weight got the best of him. Um and his career wasn't that long, but he had a tough fight with Galata yeah. that really beat him up pretty bad. But other than that, um, now nah, he was all time great, top five on any night he could have, you know, beat anyone, probably except Lennox because they had their back and forth, and I think Lennox probably was in his head a little bit. And um, but again, I can't tell because at one point, you know, Riddick was really rolling, man. He, and I think when he fought Holyfield the first time. That was the prime, the prime Riddick Bow. So that Riddick Bow against anyone, it's a tough fight. Mike Tyson, forget about it, unheard of. The fear that he instilled in men, um, you got to get over that first to, to fight him. And then in his prime, the young 20-year-old Mike Tyson, I can't imagine a 20-year-old walking in here right now and beating me up. It'd just be unheard of to my, my mind, but this is not a regular human human being. This man was not regular. A regular 20-year-old, this man was an animal. So he instilled fear. So could I have got past that? Who knows? You know what I'm saying? He's an animal, champ. So I'm lucky I'm from the neighborhood of those two guys. <laughs> you mentioned both of those there, like the Futch bow and then the D'Amato Rooney Tyson. Those primes were, I mean, admittedly, both achieved a hell of a lot in their career, but those primes were, were shorter than they could have been. Yes. Do you think that's a product of growing up in the neighborhood, being in the tough neighborhood, things happening quickly, similar to how they did with you, where it just comes all at you fast. Mike goes from being kind of a street kid to the youngest heavyweight champion of all time. Do you think that plays a factor in, in both of their careers? 100%. I think that uh, me and Mike have spoken about this before. You know, I once said to Mike, somebody asked me something, and I said, nothing was planned. Like I just told you, and Mike looked at me and said, um, "Actually, I was on Mike's show, and he and his co-host asked me about you know 
my, my past and coming up. I said, no, nothing was paying, planned. It all happened so fast. And Mike said, wow, me too. He said, it's funny you say that because now that I look back in retrospect, he said, me too, nothing was planned. It all happened fast. It wasn't like, oh, one day I'm going to be heavyweight champion and I'm going to get into boxing. I ain't know. I was looking for a job. <laughs> I used to work at an ice cream parlor. I used to work for Meals on Wheels. I swept. Uh, I worked at a printing company. I sold newspapers. I sold watermelons. I had a job. You know, I was always hustling, trying to work. And then um, boxing was a job for me. Come to the fights. And I used to go to um, to the gym, and they'd give me $5 to spar. With the $5, I could buy four chicken wings and french fries and then get a soda. And that was a meal for the day. And that's what I would live off of, a meal for the day. And I would eat once a day for many years just to survive. And I would go to the gym and somebody say, I'll give you $5 if you spar. So I said, okay, give me $5. Sometimes I spar two people, get $10. And um, so, again, nothing was planned. It all happened. And I always look back in retrospect and say, had I had um, a good team behind me and had I had planned it, Things would have turned out better. Probably, I probably would have been an all-time great, in my opinion. I think I had the skills. I obviously had something because to do it with um, very little amateur experience, no training, just to walk off the street and to become a national champion, Golden Glove champion, you know, everything, and to become a heavyweight champion in the world. I obviously had some skills and I had some talent, but it wasn't really cultivated correctly. And um, you can't go back in time, but... It is what it is. That golden era of heavyweights in the 90s. I mean, I feel like the heavyweight division always needs to be doing well. But the American heavyweight division, if the if the heavyweight division is populated with Americans and it's doing well, then that gives the rest of the sport such a lifeblood and such like a, a thriving nature. It's not that anymore, certainly in America. Why do you think that is? Why Why has America, outside of, say, Deontay Wilder, failed to produce the level of heavyweight that it produced 30 years ago when you were boxing? Because a lot of big men don't want to fight. It's, it's a very hard, dangerous sport. Um, you can do everything right and still not make it. Uh, it's the luck of the draw in some lot of ways. I've seen some phenomenal young talent come up through the ranks and then get in trouble, go to jail, just everything, lose everything. So it, it, it's not something whereas um, a lot of big men in America are diving to become boxers because it's not easy. It's tough. You got to get up and run. You got to go spar. Um, good days, bad days. You got to have a good manager. You got to have a good support team. You got it's, it's so many. And you got to have money. It's not. A, it's not. A, it's not a, a sport where people think you can walk into and say, oh, "I'm gonna be a boxer." You got to have money. You got to have money to box. You got to have food. You got to have diet. The next man, he got all the things that make him great, and you got to have that too. You got to have a whole slew of things, checklists of things that you need to be successful in boxing. Getting over the line against Sir Haile Hovic and becoming the WBO heavyweight champion of the world. Describe, if you can, that feeling and the new heavyweight champion of the world. What goes through your mind? What goes through your body at that moment? It wasn't really like the, one of the things that uh, really just made me feel, oh, wow, I did it. You know, I, I, I had the talent. Uh, I, unfortunately, in that fight, I was suffering from asthma. I was gasping for air, and um, I got him out of there in the last round. My trainer at the time, Chuck McGregor, told me, um, it's now or never, you know, and you got to knock the scout, you're losing, and I knocked him out. But it was one of those things where, as you know, I liked the time. My life was going through a lot of things, ups and downs, and, you know, I could have been more focused on, you know, on my career, but I was really going through a lot of things mentally at the time. You know, I had seen a lot of things that in boxing that um, turned me off from the sport, the business side of the game. Um, the business side had beat me up pretty bad. By the time I had Fort Lyakovic, I had been a part of uh, a public company. I had been taken public and, you know, I hadn't received the money that I should have received. I had you know how the game is, you know, the boxing stories of a manager and boxing promoter. So I was a little beat up on the game, but I was able to win the title for the second time. And and I was happy. I was happy, but I wasn't as static as I probably should be. But unfortunately, I lost the title again. And it's the ups and downs of boxing. But 
happy to be here, happy to be alive because um, it was many times in my life as a kid um, when my life was put on the line. I almost died many times, whether it was asthma, fights, shootouts, um, and even suicide. Contemplated suicide as a kid, being so broke, being so homeless, missing my mom, not having a family. Those things, they, they, they put thoughts in your head that, you know, I want to end it all. And this was something I suffered with as a child, thinking about, you know, ending my life because it was so tragic. It was so bad. I went from coming home every day to an apartment with my mom to I came home from school one day and we were evicted. We were kicked out and we really had no place to go. We went from place to place for years. And it wasn't until I got I made it in boxing that I was able to get my mother in an apartment and, you know, do something for her. But unfortunately, she relapsed and died. You mentioned there about mental health. It's something that you've spoken about very openly over the years. And kind of the rebirth, if you like, of Shannon Briggs, the, the let's go champ and kind of the version of you that is, you know, known from kids of seven, eight years old now <laughs> who know you through the influencer side of things. And, and obviously myself and other people here who are kind of the more traditional boxing fans. But Shannon Briggs is, is a thing. Oh, too Shannon funny. Briggs very much is a thing <laughs> to, to, to people of, of all ages. Yeah. How does that make you feel now? And how important was that for you to have that rebirth, to have that kind of, I don't want to call it the second phase, it's probably the 10th, 11th, 12th phase <laughs> yeah, of it's your pretty life. Much. <laughs> you know, Rob, it's funny because, uh, you know, I, I, I you know, talk about uh, suicide. I was at a down point in my life about, uh, I want to say about 14, 13, 14 years ago, and I was really depressed and I was going through some psychological issues and, um, I, 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 you know, I started saying let's go champ as a mantra because my entourage was gone, my friends was gone, my money was gone, and um, I was down, and I was really at the bottom, and I had a daughter, my first daughter, I have two boys, I have three children, two boys and a girl, and my little girl was born, and I think when I looked at my sons, I was like, well, you know, I made it, they can make it, you know, I made it on my own, they'll make it on their own, you know, they'll make it somehow because they, they're my kids, they'll find a way. But, excuse me, but um, when my daughter was born, I really, something clicked in my head and said, I can't leave this girl here without having something, you know, to stand on. So um, that's when I really started, got motivated. I got back in shape and I started less saying, let's go champ as a mantra because everybody was gone. I had to be my own cheerleader. And that's why I had to stand up and start saying, let's go champ to motivate myself. I was 400 pounds. I needed to lose weight. I was out of boxing. Everybody wrote me off. And uh, I made that return. I had 10 fights in a row before, um, you know, I was kind of put on hold. And, and now I'm back. Here I am now. You know, I think seven, eight years later, I'm getting back in shape. I just lost about 27 pounds. And uh, I'm looking to fight again this year. Hopefully this uh, next year, excuse me, next year I'm looking to fight uh, Rampage Jackson. If not him, somebody else. Anybody could get it. <laughs> Anybody. You know, I've seen you obviously over the years throughout the circuit. Now, one of the first times that I certainly remember seeing you was I was at a David Hay press conference. And all of a I sudden, scared the shit out of him. All of a sudden, <laughs> we hear from the back of the room, let's go, champ. Let's go, champ. Ben, ben, the Are we still good? Yeah, we're still good. We're still good. We're still good out the line. Let's go, champ. So, when did you decide to start chasing David Hay around? You know, it's funny because I, um, I was in America and and uh, I was, you know, it's funny because British boxing took over. You know, it was a, was a time, I want to say about nine years ago, British boxing just burst on the scene like, like nobody. I mean, really just took over boxing and boxing was pretty much drying up in the U.S. And, you know, you got to go where the money is. So I booked a ticket and um, I told, I made a, I made a post on Instagram saying I'm going to England and I'm going to talk to the queen. I'm going to the palace to see the queen to tell her and ask her why I won't any of her, you know, champions give me a shot. And when I got there, it's funny, I booked my ticket. When I get to England, I get to London, I get from the airport, I get a hotel, I go to the, um, I go to the palace and I kid you not, Rob, I never forget. It was the best moment of my life. I, I get like five, uh, police come on horses with guns, machine guns, everywhere. And they surround me. And they said, 
um, in, in, in that beautiful English accent. Champ, we knew you were coming. We were waiting for you. <laughs> and that was a big one for me. That was a big because they said we were waiting for you, Champ. We knew you were coming because there was a lot of people who had, you know, had been talking about it. And um, there was a lot of people out there. A lot of people waiting for me. And I was standing outside and I was saying, you know, I want to talk to the queen. I want her to, you know, and it was, it was funny. It was fun. And I wound up staying, you know, I was just come for a couple of days and leave, you know, a little stunt, but I wound up staying. I wound up getting an apartment and, um, wow, I really love, fell in love with England. I really fell in love with the place because, um, I think it was, it was, it was perfect timing because, you know, I, I don't think David is much loved by <laughs> as many people as he, as he thinks he is. So a lot of people wanted to see me kick his ass. I wanted to kick his ass, and also, um, I think the people in England respected the fact that I was, I came looking for him, and that I went to, I found, I think his aunt's house or somebody, and I went and knocked on the door, and it was like, I tell him I'm looking for David, <laughs> and then I went to his gym, so all of this stuff made um, a lot of headlines, and it was, it was, it was, I really fell in love with England, I fell in love with the fact that the people were, we speak, I speak their language, we all had fun and hooligans, real hooligans, those English. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> Who was more fun to torment, David Hay or Vladimir Klitschko? Um, Vladimir was fun. Vladimir was fun. Vladimir was fun because, uh, you know, he was all for it. He was all for it. David was scared. David was scared. David was scared. I scared, I scared David shitless one day. One day he was at a press conference and I snuck in and uh, I came behind him. I said, let's go, champ. And he, he jumped and he said, <laughs> he said, <laughs> when he did that, I said, I got him. It was, it was a classic, it was a classic moment. And, um, but David's the best. He's a great fighter, great champion. And, uh, gotta love England. That's my second home. Last quick couple from me. I could speak to you all day, Shannon. Thank you, um, Thank you, Rob. Vladimir Klitschko, the famous video Ooh. of you being at sea and he's on, you're out on the lake and you're in the boat. What happened there? Was that pre-planned? How did how did that happen? He uh, he 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 was living in my neighborhood. Actually, we both live in Miami, Florida. I had rented a, a town home on the beach because I wanted to just like really live on the beach. That was just something that I found to be very, um, I mean, just life changing for me. Living on the beach, the fresh air was just life changing for me. So. Uh, I found that I got word that he not he lived about six seven blocks from me. I was like, oh really? So I kept going out there trying to get a fight with him. And then this girl told me that he likes to paddle, weight paddle or something, not too far. I said, is that right? So I went out there about two times. I didn't see him. And then the third time I went out there. And my boy had a boat. We said, let's get a boat. Let's go look for him. And we and we didn't see him at first. And then we finally seen him. He was far away. And I was, and they was like, nah, let's just go back. He's not out here. And I said, no, no, look, look, look. And there was a little speck. And I said, look. And it was him. <laughs> and then um, we, we, we circled him a few times. And I was like, yo, make a wave. Let's knock him off the board. <laughs> I said, make a wave, make a wave. And we knocked him off the board. And then he was pissed. And um, the cops called me and said, hey, you could have killed him. I said, hey, man, it was just a joke. <laughs> it was too funny. All good now with you and Vladimir? Um, shout out to Vladimir. He's fighting for his country. Respect, respect to him and his brother. Great fighters, amazing men, amazing men. Forget fighters, just fighters in both rights, as boxers and men standing up for their country, fighting to keep their country. So all respect to two of the, again, great heavyweights of the of the of the of the history of boxing. Well said. And final question from me: We seemingly are. Three, four months removed from the undisputed heavyweight championship of the world. Tyson Fury versus Alexander Usyk. I'm going to leave it with you, champ. How does that fight go in your opinion? Well, you know, looking at the last fight with uh, Ngannou and, and Fury, um, you know, not much time to, to, to prepare, but enough time. And I think it's something that the, the people want. We want an undisputed champion. And if Tyson can pull it off, great. And if he can't, great for Usyk. So it's time. And then we want to see what's next. We want to see what Anthony Joshua's going to do. We want to see what Wilder's going to do. <clears throat> and then there's a lot of um, young guys coming up. Jared Anderson. You got Big Baby Miller. Um, quite a few young heavyweights coming up. Quite a few, to be honest with you. Maybe about five to ten 
good young heavyweights that might do some damage, man. So we're going to see, again, like I said, Tyson Fury last fight kind of left us a little bit like, wow, what happened? But I don't think Tyson was 100% himself prepared. He kind of took it lightly like, oh, this guy's just a UFC fighter. But this guy is a fighter. This guy was, <laughs> he was there for He was there for it. He wasn't as offensive as people like to make him think. I think the fight was a draw, if not give it to Tyson because he outpointed him. But. And he was making the fight. Tyson was really making the fight, trying to make the fight. But the guy wasn't biting off the feints and stuff like that. So I think that made it a little difficult because um, sometimes when a fighter ain't smart, he, he might be he, he not even he, – he's so stupid, he wouldn't even go for the fakes. So um, I think that helped to, to his advantage. And Tyson wasn't able to, you know, do his thing because Tyson's a, sl a slick guy and he likes to use his movement. And once he starts faking you – you're pretty much over. Once you start biting on those fakes, he gonna he gonna set you set you up for something. You know what I mean? So, um, I'm I'm looking forward to the Usyk fight. Usyk's much bigger than people think he is. People like say, oh, he's short, he's too small. Nah, he as tall as me, if not taller. Um, his work rate was higher when he first turned heavyweight, opposed to his last fight, which his work rate was a not nothing that we wanted to. Um, you know, nothing that I was crazy about. I was really excited about Usyk moving up because his work rate was so busy that I said no heavyweight can stay busy with this guy. He's he's gonna out hustle anybody. But as he as you as you gain weight, same as I did, you throw less punches, and unfortunately that's what's happened to him. But if he can change that and with the fight with Fury and hustle, hustle, hustle. But you know, listen, Tyson's a guy who can go 20, 30 rounds. Tyson Fury. So this is this is a tough fight. It's a tough fight. I'm, I'm looking forward to that fight. Okay, well, Shannon Briggs, always a pleasure. Thanks very much for sitting down with Boxing News. Before I let you go, I want you to look into that camera there. Mm. I don't want to let's go champ. Thank you, Rob. For all the boys and girls at home, champ! Let's go champ! <laughs> Shannon Briggs, thanks very much. Thank you, Rob. We had certain uh, Hamza Shiraz in here. That is a fight that I think everybody in British boxing would love to see at some point. There's a great fight between him and Hamza Shiraz. Ask me, you can ask him. We'll both say yes. He will, he will blame me. Um, I'll blame him. But he's like a promoter's favourite kind of thing. Just stop saying my name. It's kind of annoying. I'm a type of guy, if you say my name, you've got to find me now. So unless you're ready to find me, just don't say my name, please. That's, that's all I ask. Um, everyone kind of see, saw him as this big puncher, like the next Golovkin. And I just saw him as a very skillful fighter. But if he keeps thinking he's a big puncher, he's going to come on and stop. And still, WBO middleweight champion of the world. I was, I was upset at that point because it was just like, I had my chance and I let it slip. I couldn't believe I was leaving there without that world title. Like everyone else obviously fought what they fought, but in my mind, I felt like this is my time. It's all come together at the right time. I'm leaving with this belt. You had the Felix Cash fight, didn't go your way. I was really angry. So I'm sparring angry. I'm trying to hurt everyone. And they had to kind of pull back like, oh, you know what, maybe don't spar for now. And it's like, no, that's gonna piss me off. Like, do you ever wonder what your career might have been like had that not have happened? Uh, 